Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, KTG, we can hear you. Shall we start? Yes. Our friends and colleagues, Beno and Bhayo, Geoff and the members of the panel. I have three tasks to perform. One is to introduce this webinar series. Second is to introduce the chief for anchor, uh, uh, Mr. Jeff Penn, and of course introduce uh, his book very briefly. So uh, let me start, and if 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 I'm a bit long, kindly excuse me. I think you know, Banishri knows that that is my my normal practice. Uh, welcome uh, to the to the first session of the two event webinar series on improving access to land in urban and peri-urban areas. I and my colleagues at INHAF are grateful to my friend Jeff Payne and his distinguished panel for making time for this event. Everyone is, is so busy and as uh, Jeff will testify, this simple to organize uh, looking webinar does do demand lot in time, patience, coordination and planning. I must greet you all as this is the first webinar in the new year in 2023 and also because it comes after a relatively long break of four months. Uh, as I told you, we've been doing, doing this for the last two years, and this has been the longest <clears throat> break we had. Though many of the attendees to this webinar know, but as the panel members are new to this webinar series, let me briefly share what we are doing and why. We, that is in half, that's Habitat Forum, a national network of professional civil society organizations, academic institutions, and others working in the human settlement development sectors in India are doing this for quite a while now. We're doing it for almost two years. The series is on an overarching theme called Rethinking City. In fact, largely Rethinking Indian City as well. And, it's, uh, and we have by now completed 80 webinars. This is 81st. And we have covered some 30, 35 themes and sub theme and had over 360 professionals, advisors, consultants, administrators, and community groups to come and participate in this webinars. Let me also tell you why we are doing this. And I think that's an important question to answer. It is seen as a contribution to thinking through India's urban challenge as an integral part of the process of building a multi-organizational, multi-dimensional, multi-sectoral societal partnership. And I repeat the word societal partnership in search for better response to India's daunting urban challenge. Let me elaborate this a bit. The panelists in this session are urban experts and therefore they know and they're familiar with the dimensions of the urban challenge in India. But let me give you just two or three very quick statistics to tell you where we are, where we are going. India had something like 65 million people in cities when we became independent in 1950. That grew, jumped to 370 million people in 2020. 
and it is expected to reach 877 people by 2050. Doubling of the urban population in the next 30 years is a major challenge. And it will also mean that India has added anywhere between 25 to 30 people a minute to its urban, urban, urban population. This is just dimension. Let me kind of briefly touch upon the second important dimension. And that is looking at the investment need. It's projected by experts that country needs somewhere around $640 billion in investment in the coming 15 years to meet its urban infrastructure deficit. And this must be seen in the, con the scale and the complexity must be seen in the context of what we do, we did under JNNURM, which is India's one of the best managed and conceived urban infrastructure project under which in 10 years, this country invested just $14 billion over a bit of 10 years. It gives you on that to huffing and fuffing. So that really gives an idea in terms of where we stand in terms of meeting our urban challenge. It's a gigantic challenge and uh, as tough and as demanding, if not more than the climate change <clears throat> that we are facing. And we as people know that the task of providing for millions who are already in the cities and people who are walking in the cities is stupendous. And this includes cleaning our polluted rivers. This includes cleaning our air, which is seriously impact, impacting on citizens' health. This includes improving slums where conditions are often subhuman. This includes meeting calamities such as Joshimat, uh, an ancient town that is sinking. And this Im includes improving municipal finance, which is in poor health. So if you really look at this, uh, the large number of challenges that we are facing. The most important one is that in the next 30 years, if we are doubling our population, are we prepared uh, for their their housing, for their needs, for their education, for their jobs? And answer obviously is not in the positive. Also, we must remember in, as, as a country and as people that we cannot afford to delay responses. Reason is this, that is in fact, the quality of millions of people who are in the cities. And it also affects country's ambition to grow to a $5 trillion economy. So it has impact both on the economy, it has impact on the quality of the people. Meeting the challenge head on to ensure livable, people-centric, inclusive, resilient and sustainable cities, we need to bring on table abilities and the sources of many. The government alone cannot do it. We need the government, private sector, business, industry, corporate, academic community, and civil society and others to work together to find new responses, new approaches, new strategies, and new solutions. Wally and Dow, the Secretary General of Habitat II, talked about revolution in urban problem solving if the urban challenge is to be met adequately. We know it is nowhere more relevant than in the Indian context. We need new ideas. We need new perspectives. We need new solutions. Urban land is a sticky and highly complex issue. Its availability, access, and costs 
are getting increasingly difficult and unreasonable in our context. To give a small example of my own, I bought a house 20 years ago, costing just 4,000, 400,000 rupees, is now fetching 550 million rupees, 125 times uh, the, the money than I invested. I'm not going to become rich, but I'm just telling you the story in terms of what's happening. These two webinars that Jeff Penn has so kindly agreed to put together and conduct with his friends and colleagues from different parts of the world would be undoubtedly brilliant and bring in lots of new ideas. Lots of people are waiting for these ideas and these opportunities. Uh, uh, and therefore, uh, we are going to kind of wait for you for the next two hours to hear your views and ideas. Before I, I, I hand over to, to Geoff, let me introduce Geoffrey Payne, who requires no introduction, but fact remains that, you know, it's a, it's a new generation. Jeff Payne is housing and urban development consultant with five decades of experience covering all regions of the world. He has undertaken research, consultancy, and capacity building assignment for the World Bank, UN Habitat, and other international development agencies, governments, and academic institutions published widely and contributed to numerous international conferences. His main focus is on reviewing and developing innovative approaches for providing secure land tenure and property rights, advising on urban planning, land management, housing policy, and promoting multi-stakeholder partnerships to build local capacity. He lectures in several universities, has been an advisor to the Commonwealth Universities Association and British Council, and is currently a member of the Royal Town Planning Institute International Committee. His latest book is Somewhere to Leave, Rising to the Global Urban Land and Housing Challenges. I was trying to look at this, this book, but uh, before I complete my introduction, let me read a paragraph on this book by another friend, Patrick Wakeley, who is a professor emeritus of urban development, University of London. Pat says, it is an exhaustive and optimistic introduction to the urban land and housing challenges faced by the countries in the global North and South alike. The book details the complex and integrated issues of urban economic and social development and cultural conservation in the context of climate change and pathogenic pandemic. So it's a, it's a book, Somewhere to Live. The, the, the title, the page itself tells the story that is talking about millions of people in slums and, 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 and poor housing and what to do and how to do it. So with this introduction of the webinar series, introduction of Jeff Payne, and a brief introduction of his book, over to Jeff and the panel for, for, I don't, for the next two hours session. Thank you very much, Jeff. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Kirti, uh, for that very generous uh, presentation and introduction. Uh, it's a great honor to be invited to contribute to this. And I was struck when, when you were uh, introducing the webinar series uh, that you mentioned the scale of the issue uh, facing India in particular. Um, and it was on the BBC just yesterday that India is forecast to be the largest popular, most populous country in the world in the very, very near future. So the scale of the challenge uh, facing everybody is absolutely enormous. Um, now, the other thing, of course, is that the last region of the world to urbanize 
is Africa. And we're very, very lucky today to have representatives and, and contributors to the webinar, uh, both from India and from different parts of Africa, distinguished contributors, all of them. And I was very struck by the comment and the report that Alain durand Lasserre, a very, very dear friend, uh, made about the challenge facing Africa, where he's published a study which estimates that between, between uh, now and 2050, he said it uh, just two years ago, so in a period of 30 years, sub-Saharan African urban population is going to increase by between 750 and 800 million people. Now that's more than the entire urban population of Europe, including the UK, uh, plus Mexico, Canada, and the USA. And those countries, rich countries, had 200 years to accommodate that number of people. Sub-Saharan Africa is starting with 50% average living without secure tenure or formal recognition and has to accommodate that number in the next 30 years. So this, I would say, is one of the biggest challenges facing humanity. Uh, and it's also taking place at a time of the global climate crisis, which estimates that with El Nino, the next El Nino weather pattern starting later this year, even by next year, we could be facing 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial uh, temperatures average. And that is the tipping point beyond which we cannot go back. So we are talking that this webinar is taking place at a critical moment in human history. The longer we delay, day by day, the longer we delay, the more extreme the measures will be needed to accommodate that number of people and to do it in a way which is sustainable within the finite resources that the world has available. So I cannot think of a more important subject on which to introduce this, uh, the, these two webinars. Um, the, the issues that we're covering are very, very broad ranging, inevitably. And so when we were discussing how to cover them, it seemed sensible to me that in the first one, we should talk about security of tenure as a means of accessing urban land and peri-urban land. Um, and uh, so I've, invi I, I've invited the presenters today to focus on that. And then in next week's webinar, what we'll do, we'll talk about a range of other examples uh, from different parts of the world. And I'm extremely grateful to the dear friends and colleagues, who, many of whom I've known for many years, for all of you willing to uh, make a presentation uh, this week. Um, and uh, what I'm suggesting is that because the issues are so broad ranging and because we've got a large number of people attending, um, I'm hoping that we, at the end of the presentations, we can have time for discussion. Udvala, uh, who's been very kindly facilitating this um, and organizing this webinar, has kindly agreed to monitor the chat. So if any of you listening in here today uh, have any questions or comments that you'd like to raise as a result of the presentations that are being made, please do uh, put them in the chat. Udvala will then very kindly uh, uh, put them into groups and then raise these at the end of the presentations. Uh, she'll send them to me, but between her and myself, we will then invite people uh, on the panel to respond to the points that they've made or to uh, digress and to talk about any other aspects that they think are important. So we've got a couple of hours to address a massive issue facing the whole of humanity. And I'd like to start off by inviting uh, the presenters uh, to make their contributions. And the first person I'm inviting is Rohit Lahoti, uh, Rohit is a very, uh, very bright and uh, capable architect and urban development practitioner, uh, currently working as a consultant in Mumbai. He graduated from University College London, uh, where he had a Commonwealth scholarship, 
And since qualifying, he's co-founded a voluntary initiative called the Centre for Inclusive Habitat. And the details of that will be on the link for anyone who wants to follow up. But this believes in a process oriented and interdisciplinary approach towards tackling urban development challenges in an inclusive manner. He looks at affordable housing, land and property rights uh, over the, uh, um, over the uh, whole range of subjects. Uh, and we'll be talking today about a very interesting way of classifying and organizing perceived tenure. What I find very interesting in all the work I've done on tenure over the years is that you have de jure uh, tenure, the legal form, you have de facto tenure, what actually happens, and then you have perceived tenure. And it's that last one which is perhaps the most important, because even if you have secure title, you're not going to invest if you see other people being subject to eviction. So perception is really important. And Previous ways of looking at it have been in the form of a continuum, which is a linear way, which leads to the implication that a full individual title is the ultimate goal. And we all know that that's not an appropriate approach to policy. So I'd like to invite you to make your presentation and uh, then we'll uh, be able to have some discussion afterwards. Rohit, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Thanks, uh, Kirti Bhai. Thanks the team of InHalf for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Just let me know if it's visible. Is it visible? Yes. Perfect. Great. Uh, so yeah, before I begin, I would like to, first of all, uh, uh, just give a background. Uh, so this is basically, uh, uh, my uh, expansion from my master's dissertation uh, at Bartlett DPU at University College London uh, and this issue of urban land tenure housing kind of intersected in my head and eventually in the form of the work I started doing uh, during my master's and I definitely like to mention here my dissertation supervisor Ruth McLeod who was a fantastic supervisor and then of course uh, Jeff himself who has uh, been a great mentor in uh, pushing me to kind of uh, think beyond the obvious. So I'll just begin. So what is the context uh, before I kind of jump into the tenure security uh, and the perceived aspect of it? So one of the things which I, uh, during readings and uh, scanning through different work, uh, I realized that uh, the obtaining the access to secure land is often uh, kind of considered as the ability of households to produce formal proof of land or house ownership. And often this whole dualistic way of thinking legality and formality, uh, just because one has a title or a document tends to security and that, that household being formal and legal as compared to someone who does not have a title being informal and illegal kind of uh, creates a very simplistic notion of the way this complex issue of tenure and land is thought of. So the question which I was trying to arrive at is, is land titling the only way for secure tenure? And of course, this was much more propagated after Hernando de Soto's work on mystery of capital and how the idea of having a title can lead to better upward social mobility, which of course was also taken by a lot of countries, especially during the 90s period of globalization. and Again, further propagated by UN Habitat, this whole idea of continuum where you see the movement from informal to formal, it's like a stepped approach and the registered freehold becomes the ultimate form of uh, uh, ownership or ultimate form of uh, reaching an upward mobility. So I started further reading and of course, that's when I also uh, uh, researched on uh, Jeff's work on this whole idea of notional typology which he has tried to create here where he completely breaks this idea of security into a graded form or different degrees the way tenure security or the different degrees security is looked at uh, and that kind of further inspired me to uh, further understand this notion of security into three forms so of course like jeff was also mentioning so there is de jure of course which is conforms to law and as we all know the titles and documentation that is legal 
then there is de facto tenure security which is more that exists in practice uh, over a certain period of time which often communities know about it but it is not always documented it is there it is existing for a period of time and then the third part which actually interests me a lot and which is what i am trying to explain in the further slides is the idea of perceived tenure security which is often a subjective assessment of the immediate or future risks and it need not always be categorized into de facto or de jure and it can vary across uh, different communities different people within a settlement as well so what am i aiming here for is to kind of propose a framework for a non linear method uh, to gauge the perception of land and housing tenure security of the urban poor and the idea behind this is so that this approach or this framework can maybe guide the decision making of different interest groups be it civil society community based organizations or uh, the people uh, who are living in this communities or the people in the government se sector as well so what is the framework i am trying to build towards so it kind of stems from nancy fraser's approach towards social justice where it kind of she kind of breaks into this idea of redistribution recognition and so of course redistribution often tends to be much more tangible whereas recognition often is much more implicit and in a way i am trying to determine what are the range of indicators that can actually influence perceived tenure security and when i started digging more and this was based on the field work Uh, on my earlier research project which i was a part of uh, where i kind of further understood that there are various factors that go into play for example what you see on the screen there are this 10 indicators which i have broadly listed for example if you see the eighth one the political patronage now imagine if a local councillor in a particular community uh, ensures that the people from there will not be evicted till the time those particular set of people they vote for his his party or for him so automatically there is a perception of security which is being built over a period of time in people and that need not always have a document or some kind of a proof so there are such contributions for example habitat contribution which is another second indicator so there is this notion that just because people have security on the form of a document they will start investing in their home while that is not always false but there is also a security aspect which people feel and perceive and then they start investing in their Uh, house and in their setting and that's when that's also one of the indicators to kind of understand the perception factor of tenure security so like i was saying uh, this work is also stemming from different cases where i've actually went and conducted interviews for another project but i also tried to derive my inferences from that so there were three sites in mumbai three sites in jaipur all from different sort of Uh, of a different kind of context and uh, even if they might be quote unquote slums but they have very degrees of uh, the way an informal settlement is looked at so for example there are these three settlements uh, like sarvoday nagar in bhandu which you see uh, if i just show you a picture of you won't quote unquote identify this as a slum but it is on paper was defined as a slum whereas kola bandar which you see the second one it's on central government land whereas the third one which is ambujwadi it's again a mix of different land ownership so there are various degree varying degrees of issues and problems associated with different settlements so before i jump into what i eventually try to come up with i would want to kind of mention here that this research again uh, i wanted to uh, show some visual representation of tenure security or perceived tenure security and for that Uh, i kind of developed this measurement scale uh, of course with the caveat that this is a subjective assessment there is no standard measurement technique which i have used here uh, so what you see on your screen i've tried to give it a scale from 1 to 5 where 1 means the least uh, uh, least perceived tenure security level versus 5 being the highest perceived tenure security level so for example if i just uh, go into one of the indicators like effectivity of effectiveness of solidarity network so the lesser solidarity networks which exist in a settlement the the more prone it is maybe for eviction or for any sort of ad hoc development which gives the perception of tenure security a bit on the lesser edge versus the more robust the networks are the higher the perceived tenure security so this is the way i have done it so now coming to the main part of the presentation where what i have tried to do here is to move from that ladder approach or that continuum approach towards the web based approach where one does not uh, super overpower the other so each indicator each of the 10 indicator has its own way to be looked at 
So in the first diagram which you see here in Sarvodaya Nagar, I've tried to map within the scale that in that particular settlement based on my interactions, my understanding, where does this fit in? So for example, if you see the market pressure aspect, uh, which is on the top uh, left corner, so because it's in the prime location of the city, there is a tremendous market pressure. So people have a perception that that might be evicted and they might not get a house there. So that kind of fares a bit less. Whereas in terms of the location or the uh, expected tenability where you see, because it's on the uphill, so the chances of a developer coming there is slightly lesser. So the tenure security or the perceived tenure security is on the slightly upper edge. So this is how I've tried to map the idea of perceived tenure security. And in the end, what I did, what you see on the second diagram is when I created this mapping, a visual mapping of perceived tenure security, I tried to overlap all the three diagrams of each settlement. And that is when the magic happens, where you start realizing that each settlement has a very different aspect, the way it should be looked at. Rather than fighting one particular issue for every settlement, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. The idea of uh, idea of uh, finding solution or approaching a solution needs to be perceived through uh, through uh, analyzing this range of indicators depending on the context. So, uh, what are the some of the things I would like to conclude? So, one definitely is that. There are two characteristics of these 10 indicators which are important to identify the perceived tenure security. One is, of course, the intensity of each indicator. And second is the dependency chain within various indicators, which is the permutation. So there is not one about the other. There is no chronology here because it will vary a lot depending on the socio-economic, political, cultural factors of that particular settlement, region, city, country. And so my idea is that can this framework actually nudge activists, civil society, communities to kind of understand the settlements better, better calibrate their activism rather than saying that let's fight just to get this community or get this set of households a title. Can it be thought of overcoming short term crisis? Now, one prominent example here is to mention about Pani Hak Samiti, uh, Water Rights Committee in Mumbai. So what they are doing is that ensuring that irrespective of the slum, whether it is notified or denotified, they owe their right to access water and now accessing water and getting a legal water connection from the government is like a one step enough to kind of then fight another battle because then you start getting those recognition in smaller forms from the state from the government and then kind of having an incremental approach towards building security then of course can this framework nudge policymakers and the state representatives to think beyond this unidirectional solution of giving a title or giving a document and with, with this framework, maybe it can push towards exploring alternatives like community land trusts, community titling, the no eviction guarantee, what happened in slum networking program in Ahmedabad, where uh, the whole idea of giving a 10-year sort of no eviction guarantee created a very interesting sort of an upward social mobility in that settlement, despite them not having any form of a title from the government. And then, of course, self-redevelopment, where community become play the role of a developer, and then they take the loan from a bank and then uh, how the self redevelopment process can also approach. And finally, I would just take a minute to conclude. There are, of course, a lot of limitations uh, which I recognize and I am further kind of working on this. It's a work in progress, of course, because of the complexity of the issue that this quantification or measurement can also kind of not fall always right because the whole idea of perception itself cannot be measured. So can this be thought also as a checklist uh, uh, so that it is, it can it push to think about a framework rather than a, a one, two, three kind of a mechanism. Uh, not all listed indicators can always be measured. Then perceptions also have a flaw in that because they are often not perceptible to people like speculative land market investments or things which happen behind the closed door. And suddenly you are informed that there will be this kind of a development. There is a new thing which is planned in this pocket in the development plan. And of course, the last point I would mention is the measurement scale itself is subjective. So yes, it is like an inception movie. It's a perception of perception. So I completely recognize that. But here I'm just teasing and kind of proposing a framework to rethink this whole idea of tenure security. So I'll stop there. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Rohit. That's really very, very impressive and very, very, it gets us off to a very good start. What I particularly like is that you're looking at things in a fresh way. Uh, and instead of a linear 
continuum, you're looking at a layered matrix. And you don't need to apologize for the fact that it's subjective in the sense that most of the studies undertaken about the continuum, looking at ways of uh, de facto and intermediate forms of tenure, they are also <laughs> largely subjective. So I think you know, how we actually make these uh, different approaches operationally useful is something which is always going to be work in progress. Uh, now, I'm sure you, uh, you, you were too modest to say that you published a very good paper uh, on this uh, subject uh, last year. Uh, so please put that in the chat for anyone who'd like to follow up and get more information. And I'm sure you'd also be very, very happy to get uh, feedback uh, either today or at some point in the future from anyone who's listening in on that today. So thank you very much indeed. Um, right. Now, I'd like to pass on to the second speaker. Uh, who's also from India, uh, and a very, very uh, good friend over many years, and a very senior and influential person dealing with uh, land uh, issues. And that is Banishree Banerjee, who's an architect, urban planner, is a teacher, researcher, and practitioner, uh, working as an independent consultant, and also teaching at the Institute for Housing and, Housing Devel and Urban Development Studies uh, at Rotterdam. Um, she's also been helping a number of NGOs internationally. Uh, she's worked for the, uh, Kerala, uh, the Kerala government, HUDCO, Delhi School of Planning and Architecture. And her work is focused on housing, uh, poverty, informality, uh, inclusive and participatory planning systems of land management. And she's worked in many other countries besides uh, India including Myanmar, Thailand, Bangladesh, Philippines, Korea, and Egypt. She's got several publications to her credit, uh, which I hope she'll put uh, a list on in the chat later. Uh, and she's been associated with INHAP since its inception. And now Banishri is gonna look at three very innovative examples of improving tenure security. One in Odisha, India, uh, the Ban Mankong example in Bangkok, Thailand, and a very interesting community mortgage program in the Philippines. So Banishri, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeff, uh, uh, for this opportunity. I'm trying to uh, get into the, yes. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeff. And uh, I'm so glad that both Kirti and Jeff talked about uh, the issue of scale and uh, you know, that we do need large scale solutions for a lot of uh, problems that we are facing in uh, cities today, particularly in relation to security of tenure. And uh, Jeff, you mentioned the case of uh, Africa, but uh, I would say that uh, the Asian uh, situation is no better. So what I'm going to do is, like uh, Jeff said, I'm going to uh, uh, talk briefly about uh, three cases of uh, tenure security, uh, tenure programs. Uh, one is from the state of Odisha in India, and the other is a countrywide uh, program in Thailand. And uh, the, the third is, again, a countrywide uh, program from the Philippines. So if you look at the uh, overview of these uh, programs, the Jaga Mission uh, from Odisha, India, it's already very well known with its uh, UN Habitat Best Practices uh, Award uh, two years ago, I think. Uh, it is a huge program which covers all the urban areas in the state of Odisha. In the case of India, land and uh, housing, these are subjects of provincial or state governments. And each uh, uh, state has the prerogative to uh, define its own uh, program. So we do get quite a lot of uh, variety across uh, the states. Now this uh, uh, Jaga Mission of Orissa, it's a relatively young program compared with the other th uh, two. It's only just half a decade old. And uh, within that time, the target is huge, as you can see, uh, covering all uh, the 
uh, almost 3,000 uh, slums in 114 uh, urban local bodies, that's uh, towns and cities. And with, uh, you know, more than, yeah, a, a million and a half people uh, in uh, 400,000 households. Now, uh, the program is, of course, still under uh, underway, uh, like all three are. And uh, it has uh, reached well over 50% of the target. So what happens with, uh, with tenure that uh, it's been pre-decided as an act of the state government that uh, slum dwellers will get uh, non-transferable uh, tenure rights, which are mortgageable. And, uh, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's what the program is aiming to do. The second uh, one that I'm going to talk about is the Ban Mang Kong uh, program in Thailand, also very famous. And I think many people know about it. I've tried to replicate it, but without success, because the ingredients that exist uh, of this program in Thailand are uh, not really uh, something which we find uh, very easily, especially the political and the institutional support which is available to the program. It started in 2003. And this is also a large scale program across the whole uh, country. Now, what is uh, very interesting here is that uh, it's the, the type of tenure that is offered it's kind of flexible. You have community tenure, uh, community ownership. Uh, it can be rental, it can be leased. And this depends very much on what is uh, possible and feasible to bring about security uh, for poor people. Uh, <clears throat> the third is the community mortgage program, also very well known, which started in uh, 1988, but then was kind of revamped in the mid 90s. And that again is large scale, involving 120,000 households. Uh, what, it, what we're looking at here is a collective form of uh, tenure uh, for uh, uh, what are known as uh, homeowners uh, associations. And uh, after people have paid off uh, the mortgage, and this is against a mortgage, and what after the mortgage is paid off in 25 years, they can opt to have individual tenure. But so far, uh, that has it hasn't come to that really. So if we come to the first, uh, the Jaga mission, I'm going to kind of rush through because there are three of them, and then finally we'll come to some uh, conclusions. Now the whole process of uh, uh, of uh, actually allocating uh, tenure is uh, to identify partners who will work with uh, in a particular uh, city or town uh, towards this. It can be NGOs, it can be the local government, it can be even the private sector. That's at the city level. At the state level, uh, they do have a technical. Uh, uh, agencies, as they call them, uh, which which are private sector as well as NGOs, as well as we have an academic uh, research institution, the Center for Policy Research. So uh, the first thing is to identify partners in slum areas, then mobilize communities and conduct drone survey. Now this drone survey is something which is uh, made possible uh, very quick uh, process of uh, uh, mapping all these uh, uh, all the slums in uh, in Odisha, and it's gone very rapidly. And not only uh, the speed, but it's given that kind of transparency, which which helps uh, people to uh, which helps institutions to give uh, sort of credibility to the program in uh, as far as the communities are concerned. Then that is, uh, you know, uh, along with that, there is the household survey. Then uh, there is a draft proposal map, which again becomes easy, easy because of the surveys already conducted. Uh, then the community applies for land rights. 
and then uh, this is all verified and land rights are given. Now, this has happened at a very rapid uh, pace in the case of Odisha, as you can imagine. Within uh, five years, we have so many uh, of these slums uh, which have been covered. So this whole thing happens under the Odisha Land Rights to Slum Dwellers Act, and that is the tenure part. And uh, as per that act, the in situ land rights are uh, uh, conferred on slums, which are called tenable. That means uh, that uh, they are not environmentally uh, challenged or they're not required for any essential development like a big highway or something like that. Then uh, it also provides for relocation to new habitats for uh, slums which are untenable. And there's also provision for reblocking and redevelopment, uh, which so far hasn't been done. And uh, uh, as you can see that there are, there's a huge uh, number of stakeholders. And what has turned out to be uh, very important is all the technical uh, support which has been available at uh, different levels to the government of Odisha to take forward uh, this whole uh, program, as well as the kind of uh, coverage in the media, which we sometimes, uh, you know, we as uh, planners and others, we tend to neglect, but it's really very important in uh, creating a, a kind of an image of the program, giving it credibility and also giving information. Now the strategy uh, in this whole program is not just about uh, tenure improvement, but uh, the transformation of uh, slums to uh, living habitats. And that is done by leveraging uh, various uh, you know, programs and opportunities for infrastructure upgrading, then uh, drawing from the national program the Prime Minister's uh, housing uh, program for uh, housing loans, and then for social services and income enhancement uh, opportunities. So um, now that is uh, that is the case for all uh, three of these programs. Now this is just an image of how the uh, the drone uh, mapping uh, helped with decision making at the community level and uh, everybody can identify their own house and their neighbor's house and will not be left out. So that's uh, a big thing. Now, if we come to the uh, Ban Man Kong program, now we see that the process of uh, is quite different. Yeah. Uh, there, are, there are no uh, you know, top-down uh, indicators or uh, prescriptions about what kind of tenure or what kind of housing and so on. So the main action uh, really happens at the city level and at the, at the settlement level, even though it's a national program of the National Housing Authority and it's uh, uh, led by the uh, Community Organization Development uh, Institution, CODI. And uh, uh, as you can see from this uh, diagram, a citywide uh, survey uh, is really what uh, in which communities, academics, uh, local government, and uh, others can be involved. They really uh, get into a process of joint planning and search for solutions together. And uh, these solutions uh, can be on site upgrading uh, where uh, it's possible. Then uh, land. Um, you know, sharing and reconstruction if the land uh, uh, owner wants uh, a part of the land. And uh, so then it can be negotiated that part of the land uh, rests with the uh, with the, uh, the occupiers, the slum dwellers. Uh, can, we can talk about uh, re-blocking and, uh, you know, readjustment. And uh, if uh, uh, and if nothing else works, then uh, resettlement. Now there is a grant uh, which is uh, available, and it's a very flexible grant for um, purchase of land, development of land. And the uh, main thing here again is the collective tenure that uh, the community organizes itself into uh, cooperative. 
And uh, they start from the minute uh, that they form the cooperative, they start saving for housing and uh, for, for purchasing land if it's uh, required. And uh, they even for house building, they get a uh, grant uh, which, which covers part of the building uh, from, uh, from Cody for this uh, purpose. And <clears throat> you can have various kinds of housing solutions. It can be apartments, it can just be uh, upgrading of existing shacks or whatever. So it is a very flexible program, which is determined by uh, communities uh, themselves. And uh, these are just examples of what uh, reblocking, resettlement, uh, and land sharing is about. And uh, as you can uh, see in the middle, and the resettlement is uh, to an adjacent uh, area. And whereas uh, land sharing, uh, where uh, a part of the land is, um, uh, is given back to the slum dwellers after uh, the original landowners uh, take part of the land uh, back. I think these uh, solutions are pretty much well, uh, well known. But what's, uh, I think, very interesting is the processes which are behind like uh, the Jaga Mission and Ban Mang Kong are quite uh, different really, even though we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, security of tenure uh, happening uh, at the, as a kind of an end uh, result. Now, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, like I said, uh, the Ban Mang Kong is a community driven and uh, demand driven approach. And uh, uh, so the, uh, it's the communities and their networks that identify, uh, acquire the land, and uh, according to their own requirements and conditions. And uh, this is supported by uh, a uh, flexible finance uh, system. And uh, what, what we get really uh, because of this is uh, it enables uh, a variety of unconventional land options which are identified uh, by the poor. And uh, they may all be legitimate, but something uh, like the Jaga mission does not allow that to happen because it's a prescription which is coming from the top. Not bad, but it's there. So uh, the, the tenure here is again uh, collective. And uh, when uh, and and this is deliberately kept so because this is a kind of uh, uh, transition period when uh, slum dwellers uh, you know turn to property owners as Cody people say, and uh, they're very vulnerable to perhaps selling off, especially if uh, the uh, locations are advantages. So uh, this collective land tenure holds the community together. And also this connective, uh, this collective land tenure, uh, it kind of uh, sows the seeds uh, for building uh, new social relations where people uh, get together and uh, get into a whole lot of development activities, including uh, income earning and so on. Now, uh, in this whole rapid fire that I have, I, let, I go to this uh, community mortgage uh, program of, in the Philippines, where uh, again, they form, uh, you know, once uh, slum dwellers have formed homeowners associations, uh, they identify land where, uh, which is, uh, it can be uh, where they are, or if that's not possible, then elsewhere. And they are also supported by the government to find uh, land or by the municipality. And they also have uh, another uh, kind of uh, thing where, which is uh, funded, which is that uh, there is a, a, a kind of a facilitator called the originator who helps uh, the, the slum dwellers to do all the paperwork and uh, the liaison with the government uh, organization. They must also prepare a reblocking plan, which is according to uh, planning standards, and then uh, get it uh, approved. And when the land purchase is uh, approved, mm, the land ownership uh, is in the name of the uh, homeowners association, which take the responsibility for uh, repayment. 
Uh, the infrastructure is provided uh, by the municipality, and once uh, they become landowners, then they're not considered as uh, slums anymore. Uh, they can apply for house construction loan uh, once, uh, and then, uh, and there are income and pro employment programs, like, uh, for instance, uh, the uh, Japanese uh, uh, grant funding, which came through ADP has supported a lot of uh, areas which are uh, uh, part of the community mortgage uh, program. And uh, the enhanced incomes, uh, they help in uh, repaying the, uh, the mortgage. Uh, this is one of these uh, areas uh, which I visited in, uh, in uh, <coughs> Quizan uh, City. And uh, you can see that uh, people have been, invested quite a lot uh, in their in their houses. The infrastructure has been improved by the uh, municipality, and uh, this is certainly not a slum uh, anymore. Now, uh, of course, uh, one of the lessons, uh, needless to say and also coming out very clearly from these uh, examples is that there can be many pathways to uh, secure tenure. And uh, uh, even uh, when we're talking about uh, getting legal uh, tenure, like all these three examples are uh, quite different from each other. Uh, like who, uh, who really uh, uh, sets uh, uh, what kind of tenure and, and so on is uh, very differently uh, done in all these. But then uh, people do end up getting uh, legal tenure uh, which uh, in, in all these three. But then uh, I think what's also uh, very important is here that uh, uh, if you have uh, multiple points of intervention along with the uh, you know, this giving technical, uh, uh, giving uh, tenure security. Uh, it helps a lot uh, to give meaning uh, to uh, secure land tenure. So uh, if it goes with safe housing, especially with the climate uh, you know, problems coming in <clears throat> with climate change, and most of these slum areas are vulnerable to, uh, to climate change. If uh, you know they can have safe housing, uh, access to infrastructure, and uh, <clears throat> and also of course flexible finance for la land and housing, uh, then uh, th there is a much greater meaning uh, for ha of having a secure tenure, because secure tenure itself. I cannot make the poor uh, rich overnight. Uh, I'm sorry, and I Soto, but it doesn't uh, happen. The other thing is uh, some kinds of uh, overarching conditions uh, which must exist and which are there in these uh, gray boxes uh, that uh, we have here. Uh, uh, very important is a strong community and social support uh, networks. Uh, which holds the community together, and uh, they all see each other through uh, times of trouble. And then also, uh, you know, government itself or communities themselves or municipality by itself cannot do all these various uh, things to uh, help people uh, take the benefits of uh, secure tenure. So alliances, partnerships, mm, all these make a big uh, difference. Uh, then, of course, is accountable and responsible government because, uh, sorry, responsive uh, government, uh, like, for instance, in the case of uh, Ban Mang Kong, you have uh, a very, very responsive uh, institutional setup. And because of this uh, kind of setup, it's uh, not been possible to replicate the program in other countries because uh, it's very seldom that uh, you know national uh, institutions uh, they uh, you know follow what uh, community groups really want them uh, want uh, especially in terms of uh, land tenure uh, 
And of course, uh, what's uh, coming out uh, pretty clearly is also that we should have, uh, you know, a representative and participatory planning. And if it is evidence evidence based, then uh, it uh, it sort of uh, brings in uh, the uh, the technical expertise, the technology, and uh, which can work with people. And uh, things go in a much better way and satisfy uh, everyone. So with this um, very simplistic uh, and brief presentation, uh, I'd like to say thank you for the opportunity again. And hope for questions. Thank you very, very much indeed, Banishri. As always, a great presentation. And it's, uh, you've got a lot of uh, experience and ideas to draw on. Uh, one thing I think that came through particularly strongly for me was the benefits of an incremental community-led approach. And you were very right, I think, to emphasize the need for the conditions uh, to be available for these approaches to flourish. Um, be very interesting to discuss that maybe if we have time towards the end of the webinar. Uh, how can we as professionals, as academics, as activists, or as citizens help to create those conditions in which these innovative approaches can flourish? So thank you very much indeed uh, for that, Banishri, much appreciated. I'd now like to move on and introduce our next speaker, uh, who's Yuchendo Eugene Chigbu, uh, who I've uh, known for many years since he was doing his PhD in the uh, Technical University in Munich and followed his career with great interest. Uh, he's now an assistant professor in land administration at the Department of Land and Spatial Sciences uh, in the, at the New, uh, Namibia University of Science and Technology. His works fall within the interface between social sciences and geodesy. He is an associate editor of the Journal of Land Use Policy, a co-chair of the research cluster of the Global uh, Land Tool Network at UN Habitat, and also the coordinator of the Network of Excellence on Land Governance in Africa, uh, in the Southern African region. So he's got a massive range of experience in a in, in, in relatively short time. Uh, so he's very much a rising star, I, I think, in the whole field of land management. He's got a particular interest in applying land methods to societal development issues. And his most recent book, Land Governance and Gender, The Tenure Gender Nexus in Land Management and Land Policy, was published just last year. Eugene has also provided links to other publications in the chat. Now, what he's going to talk about today uh, is the flexible land tenure system that was introduced in 2012 in Namibia as a locally realistic legislation that, that creates alternative tenure options for people living in peri-urban informal settlements. This provides an incremental approach uh, to formalizing tenure status for informal land owners into newly recognized alternative land and housing tenure titles and provides an approach deserving of much wider application, not just in the region, but globally. Eugene, tell us more. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, I don't know, can you all hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah, oh, thanks, uh, Geoff. Um, I'm really, really happy to be here. And I would like to also thank the previous speakers because this, there seems to be a link between what's been spoken and what I have to say. Um, because of time, I would focus uh, my presentation, by the way, the summary of all Geoff has read to you is that I'll be talking about an incremental community-driven approach which the previous speaker had spoken about, but uh, in this case, it is um, a specific approach that's been actually um, innovated uh, within Namibia by the Namibian government and Namibians and, um, and civil society that's been considered to be good for Namibia. However, um, when I use the term locally realistic, I have to be careful um, with the use of the term 
with the use of the term realistic because um, obviously the this approach has its problems, but we can talk about that later. The, its main problem in terms of uh, the criticism it's been getting is that um, it's meant to be flexible, but it's not so flexible. Obviously, that's because of um, of bureaucracy. But it has been lauded quite a lot, and uh, when it comes to outputs and outcome, so. Namibia is a very big country in Africa, one of the 10 biggest, biggest countries in Africa, but with very low population. And uh, its population density is about three per square kilometer, um, 824,000 square kilometers, but then uh, has a population of about 2.5 million. But you would think that a poor population would mean that housing is open for all. Unfortunately, that happens not to be the case, but that again can be traced to Namibia's um, colonial period where appetite was practiced and um, um, European settlers occupied the arable land and main areas while um, the native African population uh, were restricted outside these areas. And um, in my opinion, the consequence of the consequence of this was that at independence in 1990, in 1990, most people who lived in the rural areas, since they were restricted from these urban areas, they had to move because it was uh, it became an you know uh, a way of expressing freedom that finally they can be anywhere uh, in Namibia and many of them try to go to the main cities and unfortunately when they get there they realize that despite that the racial and colonial um, fences have been removed but there are still financial fences which they have to tear down before they can get uh, into the main uh, cities and the consequence that many of them were now left on the periphery and that became the key reason for, um, you know, for informal settlement proliferation. Now, um, the picture of informality in, Nigeria, in, in, in Namibia is, I would say, growing. By 2004, informal settlements constituted about 29% of Namibia's population of, uh, uh, Vinduk's population, sorry. Vinduk is the main city. Um, by 2004, 29% of then lived in informal settlements. But by 2011, seven years uh, later, the population of the city increased. And as of 2018, 40% of entire Namibians live in informal settlements. So you can see that this is quite a big problem. And because this was a big problem, the government and uh, the civil society, um, development corporations, put hands, put heads together uh, with local people to come up with a particular land tenure system that would be suitable for informal settlements in order to upgrade them. So when we speak about the flexible land tenure system, which was introduced in 2012 in Namibia, its main aim is for informal settlement. And that's what um, makes it um, appealing in the sense that at least it was recognized that informal settlers needed, they, they, they needed to be a change in the overall system of land tenure in order to accommodate informal settlers. And they, create, they created this law of 2012 called the flexible land tenure system. Now in general, um, Namibia got independence in 2000, um, in 1990. And by 1997, the flexible Latino document, so it, had, it was there, but now seen as a vision, a strategic document, so we're looking forward to it. Um, so it went through series of debates and work up to until 2012 when it became an act passed in the parliament. Now the GIZ um, has played a central role in this, uh, not only the GIZ, but uh, the UN Habitat. And um, we talk about the Shack Dwellers Federation, they've been part and parcel of it, but the GIZ has played a very, very central role. And in 2016, um, a committee was set up. 2015, an implementation roadmap was developed and 2014 regulation committees were formed. Now, in 2018, regulations were gazetted and land rights offices established for this purpose. 
and pilots began in three places in Namibia. And these three places are in Gobanis, Oshakati, and Vinduk. Now, um, layouts were approved for this to go on in Oshakati in 2019. And in 2020, layouts were approved for Gobanis and associations were created. Obviously, the system also read my roads around incremental community driven house. So which means associations had to be created and these associations um, are supported by Shadwellers Federation to get loans which they can upgrade. And then in Gobabis in 2020 titles uh, were given. But my discussion basically is supposed to be on Gobabis, but I, from what has been discussed so far, I want to focus more on the incremental approach because at least in the entire Africa, this is the first of its kind. Now the objective and the implementing institutions, um, the objectives were obviously to create alternative forms of land title. So before that period, you would have the 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 um, the mid title would always be a leasehold. Anything you have, you have a mid a leasehold in between, and then a freehold. And so they needed to bridge this gap. So it's following the continuum thinking, um, but at the same time, um, it is particularly developed for informal settlements. So improving tenure is a key issue and empowering the person's concerns. The Ministry of Agriculture, Water and Land Reform in Namibia are uh, the key management agencies, but there are other ministries, for instance, the Ministry of Urban and Rural Development have to deal with the planning issues. You have local authorities involved, and then you have the land rights office developed particularly for, for this, and then the informal settlement community associations. It's a scheme system, so there, was, oh, there will always be associations in between and then local and international organizations. The GIZ, like I mentioned, has been key to this. The UN Habitat, the Global Land to Network has come in in terms of capacity development and and that. Now, the principles behind it, as the name implies, is about flexibility, is about desirability. Um, is desirability because the, 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 the scheme, since it's a scheme-based system, the individuals or, or associations involved have to apply. And then there'll be registration of settlement blocks. So the previous speaker has talked a lot about re-blocking. This is very much based on re-blocking. And participatory uh, settlement planning is key to it. Uh, there's a formation of associations and then determination of locations. Um, now, it runs parallel with the existing system and as well it's interchangeable because it moves in a continuum. Now the diagram I'm showing here reflects the key elements. On starting on, 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 on the left, you will see in a typical situation of settlement. So it moves usually in that settlement, people would, the conventional system is that they will aspire for freehold. Now what the flexible land tenure system has done is that it has brought in between two titles, one called the starter title and the other, the landhold title. So from the point of informality, one could get a landhold title and a landhold title is similar or the same as a freehold, except that you are holding it within a scheme, whereas a normal freehold title is not. So the innovation is bringing the two in between titles, the starter and the landhold. Now, the informal settlement is a situation generally where there's no, there's no much of tenor security. And um, this is very, very important in Namibia that there's no tenor security when it comes to informal settlements because when you, for anyone who's been to Namibia or the Southern African region, you would see that many of the informal settlements are usually constructed with corrugated iron sheets. Actually, the law particularly states that it is illegal. And because it's illegal, so even if you were to be in a, even if I were to be an, in an informal settlement, I wouldn't be able to put up a blockhouse because um, that's actually against the law completely and you'll be held for it. So that's why people tend to put up corrugated iron sheets depending on where you go. 
when you go to the southern parts around the ocean areas, the informal settlements, they use plastics. As I'm speaking to you in today's uh, headline in Namibia about um, how many, some number of people died because of um, informal settlement fire. And this is very frequent when it comes to those areas where informal settlements are made up of plastic. And um, many a times the reason for this is because those areas are usually this, they have very high saline rates around the coastal area. And so they tend to use plastic rather than use corrugated iron sheets. So at this point, to get a starter title, the starter title itself in the first place gives the right holder the access to actually have a dwelling place in a specified location within a block F. Now, an F is simply um, a plot of land. It's a, it's a typical term used um, in Southern Africa, or in South Africa particularly. But the standard title does not give you the full right over the land. Now, after you move to the landhold title, you get it becomes a form of title that gives you, makes you a landholder and gives you the same right over the piece of land. So that means, as you will see, as you will see in the diagram, for the starter title, it's a community thing. So here's the community block house, and then you get um, starter titles, which allows you to go to the next stage. And then when you come in um, into the landhold title, you can now get your own title within the the scheme and then this can go to freehold in theoretical terms i don't know um my my assessment of this is that the idea behind the flexible land tenure system is actually the assumption that one has to make a social investment in land before a financial investment um, so, which means you get a, a, a standard title and a landhold title and housing is is supposed to be at this point, at this level, is considered to be a social issue. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, obviously, because of the society we live in, the idea of housing always leads to investment, investment. And so you do still have people complain with landhold titles, um, you know, for it. Land, their landhold titles not being exactly you give you know given the same status as a freehold, but I think it is a continuum issue that uh, in order to create generational um, generational wealth, first of all, get people settled, own um, own piece of land, enjoy the rights prior to the um, freehold title system, but that's in theory. The standard title allows you to erect and occupy um, a dwelling. Um, titles can be transferred, which is what makes it a good title. It can be transferred and it can be leased to another person or bequeathed. The scheme can be upgraded to landhold or then freehold. But the issue is that it cannot be used as a collateral. And no more than one Start, starter type starter right can be held by anyone so with the landholds it offers you the same but in this case you it you can use it to secure mortgage with a plot but still you have to remember that such a security is still within the scheme and um i'm not aware about how much the banks are dealing how the banks are dealing with this but you are allowed to uh, use it to secure mortgage. So that's the difference between the starter and the landhold. Now, in terms of how, in terms of output, um, my experience, and I have some papers that I've shared. My experience is that the Namibians are complaining about the system because it doesn't offer the procedure that they expect, which is the flexibility in terms of quick you know, um, um, quick upgrading, quick access. Um, but however, uh, in terms of output, in terms of how it's regarded within uh, within the society and within the markets, there seem to be less of complaints in that regards. And the picture you see here is um, in 2021, um, some startup titles were finally upgraded to landhold titles um, and the GLTN were sharing this on, you know, on their platform. 
But with the key specific issues here is that uh, in this project, about 700, it started with about 709 um, households, with, of which, you know, out of 3,149 occupants, 52% uh, of them are um, female house, female led households. And um, the Shandwellas Federation worked together with the Namibian Ministry of um, Land Reform um, to provide funds and the Namibia ministry provides the fund and the Shangri-Lans works with the schemes to get loans from banks. And this has been very successful in terms of um, outputs, um, but has been very slow in terms of, um, you know, uh, the procedures. And the big question now is, has been always, um, <clears throat> what was the flexibility meant for? Um, the government argues the flexibility was in terms of tenure, um, tenure upgrading, and um, the key problem beneficiaries have is how long it takes for them to get there. The blocking process takes quite a lot of time. Um, there is that issue of certain people not being able to um, get into certain associations because you must have an association in order to belong to an association in order to be integrated into this. But in general, this has been um, quite um, a positive one in terms of its innovation and uh, an approach, but debatable in terms of the procedures and time wasting periods. Thanks very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Eugene, for that uh, very comprehensive presentation. Um, it raises the interesting uh, issue of the shadow of colonialism, uh, which has influenced the starting point or the framework within which the land, is, land management is undertaken. And you also mentioned the importance of flexibility. Uh, so thank you very much for raising that. You've also touched on a few issues which others have touched on. Um, so we're getting a consistent pattern emerging, I think, in these presentations, uh, which I'll uh, summarize later on, perhaps. Uh, but I'd like, like, now like to introduce my next speaker, who's a very, very good friend who I've known for some time, and is a very influential senior person uh, on these issues, and that is Mark Napier. Uh, Mark is the principal researcher at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. Uh, in South Africa. He's a visiting professor at the Center for Development Support at the University of the Free State. And Mark graduated as an architect from the University of KwaZulu-Natal and studied housing and development at postgraduate levels at Newcastle University in the UK. He led the UK aid-funded urban land markets program from 2006 to 2013 and is currently project leader for the Urban Knowledge Exchange Southern African Initiative. Um, Mark has worked, lectured, and published in the areas of land and housing markets, home-based enterprises, and incremental housing processes and housing adjustment. Mark is going to reflect on the South African post-1994 government subsidy housing program as a mechanism for land tenure distribution with both its successes and its clear limitations. And with a great deal of land and shelter has been transferred to households, the programme worked well for a time, but increasingly could not take on the powerful land market forces. Uh, so Mark, I very, very much welcome your presentation and look forward to hearing what you have to say in this uh, major country addressing these issues. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, everybody, and thank you, Jeff, and um, then have for the very kind invitation to to this discussion. Um, yeah, my my input is perhaps at a higher level than some of the others, and it's more of a possibly a thirty year case study at a country level. Uh, but hopefully, I'll end off with some more <clears throat> practical hope for a way forward. Um, yeah, in terms of just the context of South Africa, I'm in a council, it's a scientific council, that's a parastatal organization within the country. Uh, we've got a population of 60 million, 68% um, is urban 
12% informal. Um, and I'm going to speak uh, quite a lot about the state housing program, which has a annual budget of around 33 billion rand, which I think is 158 trillion rupees, but I, I'm not sure if I've got the numbers right. Uh, almost $2 billion a year to spend on a housing program that is based on a set of subsidies, which I'll mention. Um, let me just see how I can, yeah. So I'll start with a bit of context around the, the housing policy. Um, I'll then just set the scene in terms of the numbers of um, houses that have been produced and different types of things produced through the through the state um, housing program, but with a reflection always on the land issues and on the tenure issues that have um, resulted from the program, then looking at the outcomes and then what's the future outlook, and as I say, some um, ideas for a way forwards. Um, I know I've got some colleagues in the room, and and a lot of this came out of work in uh, between 2005 and 2015 with the Urban Landmarks Program. Some of the people are in the room and I'd like to acknowledge all of those, those people's work. It's not an individual's work, this is a big um, group, but the views that I expressed are obviously my own on, uh, on the day today. So the state um, housing program in South Africa um, after the end of apartheid in 1994, uh, was based on a housing subsidy that paid most of a house, a small house on a plot of about 250 square meters, 40 square meter house. That was called the individual housing subsidy that was then allocated to people below a certain income. Um, since then, other forms of subsidy have emerged, but that was the dominant one. Um, there's also one to help you purchase a house there was also a rental housing subsidy. And then this, secondly, um, especially post-2004, um, there's been more support for incremental housing, but also from early on, self-help housing supported through the people's housing process, uh, which included in its design phase a visit to India to learn from the country's uh, experience at the time uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, and then a service sites program, and then that's becoming more um, active now in terms of a delivery mechanism. And then another program also post-2004 uh, on upgrading informal settlements. So that's the kind of context uh, in which we work. Um, it's a grant to people. People don't have to pay it back. But then the idea is that it is quite a neoliberal, if you want to call it that, policy in that the property transfers through full title to an individual household, um, and then it cannot be sold, uh, at least legally, for the first eight years of occupation, um, and then after that it can be traded. But that's the basis and the assumption behind the housing program. So in terms of what's happened, Going from with numbers, this is based on quite a few people's work, but this was put together in this form by David Gardner. Um, since 94, the production of housing units, so the red is these what we call RDP houses, which was a reconstruction development program, sometimes called something else. We're very good at acronyms. Uh, we have an acronym for almost everything, but they basically those small subsidy houses of 40, 50 square meters on 250 square meters of land, typically. Uh, and that's it ramped up to 98. And then it started to sort of fall off after that. And then you can see that the service sites start to become more common as a form of delivery. But generally, the trajectory of these, these small RDP houses or the small sort of concrete block house on land that becomes a private property to that household that has not maintained as a mass housing program that's not maintained its volumes so that um, 2016 uh, the departments made a statement that they'd completed 2.8 million houses uh, we think it's more like 2.5 million um, but another almost million service sites and then the rental units uh, with so social housing institutions 
not a huge scale intervention, but very important in terms of location and quality and density of housing, 120,000 units. So that was 2016. If we look then, um, and this is work from 2014, um, ourselves and the Center for Affordable Housing Finance in Africa have been tracking the fact that the houses are being produced at producing numbers, but the title deeds that are meant to be handed to the households that receive the houses are not keeping track. So several of us doing work over the years, and especially taking it forward, Center for Affordable Housing Finance. And what you can see is that number of title deeds in the orange that are in becoming evident in the National Deeds Register are not keeping track with the numbers that um, are being produced. And, and this is practically true on the ground. There's now a, well, since about five, six years ago, there's, a, there's an attempt or a program to try to catch up with the title deeds that haven't been allocated to households. And it was seen as a bit of an expensive, slow process to, to declare a neighborhood properly and then to do the proper legal process and then to subdivide the property and transfer it. And so it's become a victim of the, the effort to try to keep things speeded up. But I'll, I'll show now that it's, it's not just that, it's also that the system of titling is itself unreformed. So again, uh, work by the Center for Affordable Housing Finance, their assumptions, I won't go through all the details and we can leave this presentation with you, including with references. Um, they estimate that of the 2.3 million RDP houses or these houses that are meant to transfer, um, and then people in informal settlements who are also meant to get deeds on their land, it would come to around two and a half million, but there's only in total just over 2 million. So there's at least what they calculate, 434,000 deeds that are um, basically owed to housing. So that being a title deed as an um, individual title to the property. And then that backlog is the, the subject of the, this program to try to catch up and to find it. But the longer that it's left, the harder that it gets because people who were the original beneficiaries, as we call them, of the subsidy might have moved house, they might have passed on, they, they might have done an informal sale. Um, and it's very hard, the, the longer it um, is not transferred, the harder it is to, to transfer the, the title deed to a person or a household, and then obviously it gets contested. So my back of the envelope, like literally back of the envelope on, on the spreadsheet, is that of the 62,000 hectares that should have been transferred, 17% of that land is not transferred because of the shortage or this backlog in titles. So in fact, we it's more like 50,000 hectares of land um, underlying. And this these numbers, by the way, in, on this slide are urban, because in the rural housing program, there's a different forms of tenure. So I'm really only speaking urban, at least on this on this slide. Um, but it points to a bigger problem with, with titling. Um, not only is mass housing a difficult kind of program that might have suited a newly independent country with a, with a huge history of, of desperate inequality and um, uh, distribution unfairness, so I think mass housing was efficient and effective and titling was, effi was efficient for the first 20 or so years. Whether it's now still appropriate is the question that, that we're posing. So in terms of outcomes, the, um, the outcomes that we're looking at are sort of low density settlements, quite far out from city centers, uh, these small houses, this is what they look like, the, the, the RDP houses, so-called. And, and that's the kind of urban form that we're getting. And, and that does consolidate over time. It does, uh, a peripheral location, if you leave it 30 years, does become more central because cities grow around areas. But at least for the first 10 to 20 years, difficult places to live, uh, long transport commutes, um, expensive to, to get to job opportunities. So there's a lot of effort definitely since 2004 to reverse this trend, but we are still left with a backlog of 2.6 million housing units. That's currently another 56,000 hectares. So if we transferred to private ownership 51,000, 
you've got another 56 waiting. And by 2045, that would have escalated to 2000. And this is work done by Pegasus and Shisaka. So what we're looking at is a bit of a vicious cycle um, that this big mass housing program, at least in the last 10 years, um, has, has not been able to take on land value because it doesn't put money aside for land. And it also develops very low density, as we have seen. Uh, this leads to poor peripheral locations. There's reduction in reduce, you know, in rate of, of house building for a variety of reasons. Because of the shortcuts with title, um, there's increasing tenure security, insecurity on the housing that, that should have been titled. Municipals can, municipalities cannot then enter a, a proper legal uh, within the current system relationship um, in terms of levies and property rates and selling property. Um, and so essentially then that leads to greater backlog. So even what you're doing is not landing properly like it should, it, at least like it should in the conventional titling system. So it really does call for, for other approaches. So looking forward, um, the, the land issues as we've seen in other situations is, is very political. Um, the rural land reform in, in this country receives a lot of airtime in terms of justice and redistribution, um, whereas urban land reform is, is not properly understood in, in, in terms of the housing program and other programs that give people place in the city. And there's a disconnect between the, between the discussions of land reform in urban and rural areas. Secondly, um, the new housing minister or human settlement minister on the left on the poster there, um, gave some statements in September last year, a few months ago, and very clearly um, emphasized the land issue, talking about the hunger for land. And essentially, the Human Settlement Department now sees a move towards away from these little houses and more towards serviced land um, as a way. But it's quite a crude response and, and the steps between land acquisition and, and, and servicing and transfer in some way to people, to households, is, is not always well thought out. Although there is a lot of institutional strength, uh, potentially, to do these processes. Another one uh, is that there was a, quite a good land assembly policy that was developed, which pulled apart how the government supports the greenfield development on new land uh, infill, which is now very important if you're going to achieve like better location. It can't just carry on being greenfield on peripheries, uh, the need for densification and then to address informal settlements where they are, not just see them as part of the queue or the, the waiting list for, for formal housing. Um, the, the issue with this land assembly policy is that it hasn't been adopted and it's quite progressive and quite well balanced, but it's a lot often there's not a follow through um, and there's various reasons for that, but the vested interests in the current system are quite strong. So this is a bit of a busy slide, but certainly there's need for structural changes. The, the property and tenure forms available in the country are, are quite still quite limited. Um, the last talk has was is, is very fascinating. I think South Africa could send a delegation to Namibia um, to learn from the from this from this new system that's been developed there, the flexible land tenure system. Certainly there's there's people being being advocating for this in this country for, for a long time. There's very developed thinking. It just hasn't um, been taken on in the formal system. The deeds registry system that exists is really designed for the wealthy, uh, very inaccessible, very expensive. Um, if I give a lecture at a university about land issues, a question from a student is normally, my grandmother died, should I bother to, to transfer tenure? We know the title deed. And everybody's opinion is that it's too expensive, it's too inaccessible. Um, and then that is, you know, there's a huge barrier to entry for most people into the current formal system. And so we see an increasing divergence between the life of the not so wealthy, very poor, and, and the wealthy, and two different systems. Cadastral reform, um, I've talked about urban land reform not meshing well with the housing program. Um, and that politically and philosophically is important to, to achieve. Um, cost of land needs to be factored in. 
there needs to be different mechanisms because our current grant mechanisms really favor this peripheral low density, poorly located cognitive settlement. Um, the legal rights and recognitions of settled communities is fairly strong, but could be further strengthened. Informal settlements are often not in city plans. They're seen as a waiting list. They're seen as transitional. Um, that is changing, and cities like Durban or Itaguini have got much more sophisticated systems. But recognition of informal settlements in the land use schemes is important. And this mismatch between the formal building standards, which are going up and up, and, and self-build and low-income building practices, which are, as the previous speaker described, um, really very basic. And, and then the building standards that are formal are just completely out of reach of the, most of the poor. And in a context of climate change and increasing temperatures um, and the, the amounts of building that's under, that's under steel or corrugated iron um, and other major issues apart from the pandemic, um, these things become very, very real. Um, I won't talk much, but the, there's a lot of work, and I'll put those in the references around local recording of land rights and transactions, local forms of land management. Um, again, by a lot of colleagues of mine that have done this work in, in the country and uh, in countries neighboring. Um, more flexible land use schemes. So Johannesburg has experimented with alternative land use schemes. Um, and then local forms of information that's fed to people that allows people access to what rights they do have. Um, and then just to finish off, we've got this urban knowledge exchange that um, we've got a we've got a sort of a land theme, and there's a lot of resources there to to look at. Again, mostly South Africa, but but a, num a fair number of um, Southern African country examples. Um, there's information about the country, there's information about particular um, angles around sort of mapping informal settlements, gender rights, uh, promising practices around incrementally securing tenure, um, work by people like Lauren Royston, um, John Duplessis, who's also in the room, and there's a lot of work on that. And then finally, this idea that you can strengthen people's position in cities. So. I think Brazil has done this more effectively, but how can you carve out, how can you protect um, high value land for, for use by people who, who wouldn't necessarily afford it on the market? So we've written a bit and I've left some references there again, and I'm happy to distribute this um, via this via this webinar. But yeah, I'd like to thank you and I'm happy to follow up on any of these issues. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. And uh, your last point about the politics is obviously a very, very key one. Um, one of the things that uh, obviously makes your presentation different to the others is the scale. Um, and uh, this was picked up by Barry, who says that um, many of the pilot projects uh, are individual examples um, and uh, don't go to scale. Uh, yours did go to scale, for which, you know, which is a major achievement at a time of massive social, political, economic change in South Africa. Uh, you're very honest about the limitations and uh, lessons to be learned from it. Uh, one thing is, is quite clear is that location was an issue. Uh, people had to travel quite a long way from the new housing projects. And as you say, the land cost is very, very much a factor. I also see that the plot sizes of some of the houses was quite large and wonder whether that might actually also have been uh, a factor in actually uh, making it uh, more, more difficult and, uh, and less affordable. But thank you very much indeed for that presentation. Um, and uh, I'm sure you'll be happy to take up any questions that come up in the chat. And I'd like to move to the next presentation, which is by two very enterprising Indian professionals, uh, Vijay Gopal and Shantanu Rout. Both of them graduated with a master's in international cooperation in urban development from the Technical University in Darmstadt, which was part of the uh, uh, very, very impressive uh, pan-European uh, project, uh, uh, which has uh, been uh, underway for some years. Uh, Vijay has acquired international experience in the humanitarian and development sectors. He engaged in the humanitarian shelter and settlement work of the Medicines on Frontier, 
and also supported a people-centered Smart Cities flagship program at UN Habitat. Furthermore, he's had experience in India's Bangalore Smart City project. Shantanu completed his internship with my uh, consultancy, Jeffrey Payne Associates GPA in 2021, during which he was very helpful in uh, undertaking some research for when I was uh, preparing my last book. Uh, and uh, he also collaborated with me on various short-term research projects. And he's been working since then uh, on a wide range of projects in India. They are going to talk today about the uh, Map Kibera initiative, uh, which was motivated by the lack of publicly accessible maps and other data about one of the most well-known informal settlements in the world, in the world, Kibera in Nairobi, Kenya. The initiative focused on training a group of residents to map and generate data on the settlement using digital technologies such as GIS and GPS. I could say more, but I'd rather hand over to them to tell the story. So over to you, BJ and, uh, and uh, Shantanu. We look forward to hearing your story. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, uh, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, and also thank you, in half for the opportunity. So today, uh, diversifying the attention from the greater issue of secure land tenure, we would like to bring to your attention the importance of having uh, good data generated with the help of the community in bringing forward the initiatives of urban development and in general, bringing secure land tenures and secure housing policies on the ground uh, with the community. So we would like to present the initiative of Map Kibera with you all. I'll just share my screen, just hold for a moment. Uh, I hope this everyone can see the screen. Yeah. So yeah. can you yes. see my screen? Yes, we can. All right, yeah, I'll begin. So we will go towards introduction and overview of the project its outcome and our conclusions and reflection. And then we'll, of course, at the end, we will move forward with the discussions. Uh, so Kibera is one of the biggest informal urban settlement in the world and one of the oldest in Africa, just five kilometers from Nairobi city center. Uh, the population ranges between two, 250,000 to 500,000 uh, and distributed amongst 200 settlements. Kibera occupies around the area of around 2.5 square kilometers and government owns most of the land. 10% of the people are shack owners, renting them out on the rent uh, to the tenants and remaining 90% residents are the tenants with no uh, secure rights. Mm, until 2019, uh, sorry, until 2000, 2009, Kibera on the ground on the government record was just recorded as a forest area. Uh, it is due to lack of availability of the map, data and other public, public and open and shared information. Other parts of Nairobi were at the same time, the other parts of Nairobi were well documented by online and paper maps, but the city's most densely populated part in the informal settlement remain invisible. As you can see in the picture below, uh, uh, the dense area is all uh, Kibera slum but it was sadly, it was just mapped as a forest area. Mm, so Map Kibera, here comes our initiative uh, called Map Kibera. Map Kibera was started as an initiative in 2009 to train the communities uh, with open GIS based mapping, citizen journalism and video. Uh, it also aims to collecting and using open data, social media platforms, citizen feedback through technology and promotion of mobile technologies. Basic goal was to alter the existing local information dynamics by helping residents to amplify their views using increasingly accessible new technologies. It partnered with OpenStreetMap and local organizations such as Social Development Network, uh, Carolina for Kibera, and Kibera Community Development Agendas. Mm. Yes, uh, now I'll start with what the project actually involved. Uh, but Shantanu, can you uh, make the presentation full screen? I think it's zoomed out. All right. Yeah. So looking at uh, what the project actually involved, 
the initiators of the project uh, trained 13 young inhabitants of Kibera to use uh, handheld GPS devices, uh, global positioning system devices to map the various amenities within the settlement. Um, the results of this mapping were then mapped on a, a digital platform called OpenStreetMaps, which is open source, as in anyone can access it and also edit it and input uh, new data. Uh, apart from the OpenStreetMaps, a physical uh, paper-based map was also produced. Sorry, I think uh, there was a connection issue, so it just got. Yeah, no problem. And uh, yeah, the physical uh, paper map was then taken to the wider community by the project team to uh, facilitate a discussion because uh, a big percentage of the population living in the informal settlement uh, did not have access to internet or uh, lacked the skills to uh, access a digital platform like open street maps and contribute to it. Um, fourthly, I think uh, there were online and offline channels created for the community to then disseminate information to the wider public. And uh, these platforms involved a website in which the map was shown and uh, various events taking place within the settlement was uh, communicated on a daily basis. And uh, another uh, channel was uh, a news network, which was essentially a YouTube channel uh, in which the project members were constantly uh, uploading um, yeah, news videos of events taking uh, place in the Can session. I interrupt you? Yeah, sure. I think the uh, points so, are not coming up. Yeah, yeah, that's why uh, I will, for a moment, I will stop sharing the screen and reshare sure. it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there's an issue with internet and i'm sorry for the inconvenience guys uh, uh is it okay if i keep it on not yeah on it's okay mode yeah yeah that's still visible don't worry all right yeah uh, so just let me know if you want me to change this slide yeah yeah move you can move to the next slide Shantla. thank you uh so this image shows uh kind of the result of uh the mapping process which is uh, kind of not yet digital. So it shows the different kinds of amenities or facilities that were mapped. As you can see, there were uh, toilet blocks, schools, both formal and informal, uh, a library, various healthcare facilities, and so on. An important point to be noted here is that uh, um, the initiators of this project, the organization, uh, did not instruct the professional, I mean, the inhabitants who are mapping these uh, facilities to map specific amenities. So it was what the mappers thought was important uh, that they mapped. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, as I said earlier, uh, the map was then uh, taken back to the wider community for creating discussions. It was, uh, Again, a physical map that was taken to them. Um, in this step, the community could make corrections to the map, also uh, provide their inputs on uh, various representations. And uh, yeah, the broader aim was to create discussions and, and the most recurring themes were education, uh, safety, and also healthcare. Uh, next slide, Chandra. So this is, um, how the open street map of Kibera looks at the moment. Uh, what was once a blank spot on the map now has so many different amenities mapped in. As you can see, there are toilets, healthcare facilities, schools, shops, water points, restaurants, uh, bars, and so on. So uh, what we can see is that it is a thriving city within a city. Yeah, over to you, Shantra. Next yeah. slide. So what was the, so discussing about the outcomes of the project. So Kibera News Network was created to respond about the news and events happening within the Kibera. Uh, previously, the Kibera was looked in a bad spotlight. And whenever there was an incidents happening in the Kibera, that's when it was in the discussion. So, but the life itself inside the slum was not never to be discussed. So this network came into existence. Initially, uh, 
as we discussed before, like uh, 28 small inform informal schools and 19 public toilet blocks were mapped. And also the local entrepreneur entrepreneurial ventures like movie theaters or vegetable farms, et cetera, were also mapped. Uh, discussion within the community uh, regarding the most pressing issues like health, education, access to sanitation or housing was put forward. And through the mapping exercise, what actually happened is uh, the local authorities got aware of what are what is happening inside the slums and what are the needs of the uh, slum dwellers. And thus, many of the uh, many of the policies which were put forward later was res in response to the mapping exercise which was done during the period. And it's still uh, ongoing exercise. Also, as a result of mapping exercise, many of these maps were painted on the walls inside the Kibera. The intention here was to disseminate the information on the safety level and locations of various amenities and support points inside the, inside the community. Uh, yeah, over to you, EJ. Yeah, next slide. Now we come to the conclusion and some learnings that we take out of this case study. Uh, firstly, it's very important to involve local community residents and local stakeholders in uh, data generation. This helps in creating a sense of belonging and also brings about community upliftment. Um, it also helps in creating or facilitating a discussion on how to improve the settlement wherein uh, the community members are not passive beneficiaries, but active participants in the conversation. Um, secondly, evidence suggests that uh, the MAP Kibera project or geospatial techniques used in Kibera uh, help the government to mobilize a multi-criteria decision-making system for slum redevelopment, uh, planning better access to infrastructure for the community. Uh, for instance, uh, in the map, they had mapped several uh, dark spots wherein crimes were taking place repeatedly, and uh, the government was then able to provide street lighting there. That's just one example of uh, pro provision of amenities based on this collected data. Um, thirdly, to ensure the sustainability of participatory mapping projects such as Map Kibera, a mix of technologies and techniques may be used depending on the context. There have been other projects in different parts of the world where GIS technologies have been used. Uh, there have also been self-enumeration techniques and uh, other technological approaches where uh, smartphones have been used, for instance. But then it is important to ensure that it fits the context and the residents. Um, uh, also, sharing offline paper maps are uh, very important. This helps in overcoming the digital divide um, as, as many of the residents do not really have the skills to uh, operate on digital platforms such as open street maps. Yes, mm -hmm. next slide and over to you, Shantra. Yeah, and furthermore, uh, open community-based data collection can lead to greater trust. Uh, as there's a there's always an issue of having a lack of trust between the authorities as well as the community itself. So initiatives like this with the community can help overcome these challenges. In challenging settings, uh, in-depth and lasting static, static results can best achieve with the strong community integration. And the key missing pieces is lack of trustworthy data sources that can accessed and verified by all stakeholders, especially the stakeholders or the local communities which are on the ground can help the key the points, like uh, bridging the gaps. Uh, maps are very political in nature and often used by authorities to argue against provision of infrastructure. Hence, it is crucial for the communities to be part of the data generation and helps trust as well as create a sense of belonging within the community itself. Uh, having be better data and access to a range of information that is otherwise often non-existent in the government records can help better manage the urban development processes in informal settlement, ranging from better access to land and tenure security to the basic amenities. And, and finally, uh, we would like to say that lack of data in developing countries is the biggest challenge. 
and when it comes to dealing with variety of issues having a credible data generated along with the community uh, can be a way forward to deal with the urban challenges that we are facing right now. Uh, thank you for your time. Yeah. Thank you thank very you. much, BJ and Shantanu, for a very, very well coordinated uh, exercise. You switch between each other uh, with the slides and the issues very, very well. So thanks very much for that. Very polished. Um, you're absolutely right that uh, information is power. And a lot of communities lack the information to know how to uh, advance their case and to record what they've got and what they need. Uh, so your study, I think, has been a very good illustration of uh, the need for communities. If they don't own the land, they at least own the process of improving uh, tenure security to it. Um, you're absolutely right also, of course, to talk about the politics. So well done for that. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, and now we move to our final presentation, uh, which is by a very, very uh, uh, dear friend, Robert Holm, uh, who kindly invited me for many years to lecture on his course uh, in East Anglia. He's an emeritus professor of land management at Anglia Ruskin University in the UK and a chartered town planner. He's undertaken research and consultancy um, on uh, all, well, in all regions of Africa on land management issues. Published very widely, uh, his la last book uh, was in 2020, Land Issues for Urban Governance in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and uh, he did another book, uh, The Making of British Colonial Cities, 2013 by Routledge, Essays in African Land Law and Case Studies in African Land Law, 2013, uh, and Demystifying the Mystery of Capital, a land titling in Africa uh, and the Caribbean in 2004. So he's very, very widely published, very experienced on the issues. And he's going to talk about the issue of the legacy of colonial planning in Africa and how that has influenced centralization, rigid laws, and a willingness to demolish informal settlements. So I'll say no more, uh, but pass over to you, Rob, for your contribution. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Okay, and uh, I'm ready to screen share now. Can you see my screen? No. No, Rob, there's, there's no screen. Moment. Maybe Ujvala could help uh, present it for you. Or... Yes, sure. Let me just do that. Rob, um, uh, have you gotten a chance to press the bu green button called share screen? Yeah. At the bottom of your Zoom screen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is is it not opening up? Maybe not. I don't know. Okay. Uh, let me let me just. Rob, uh, would it be possible for you to sh um, send me your presentation and then I will share my screen? How do I do that? You can just send it uh, via email to me, ah. Yeah. Okay, we'll have a short pause anyway. We've been extremely lucky throughout uh, today's webinar. So it was inevitable that we would yeah. have one pitch at one point. Yeah. Uh, so Hey, Rob, uh, we'll uh, be happy to get your link through shortly.
while we're waiting uh, for this to come through, to Rob's presentation to come through, uh, let me just say that we are looking forward very much to a, a number of very distinguished and experienced contributors to the website, to, to the webinar next week. So please do log in and register for the same time on the 25th of January, when we'll be talking about a wide range of examples of innovation, and also talking about the wider political implications, uh, which uh, we can draw from them. Uh, the key takeaways I have at the moment for the, the web chat is that community engagement is absolutely vital if we're going to have uh, success in these issues of improving tenure security. Another major advantage, of course, is the fact that the incremental approach does seem to be a very effective means of improving. And uh, as the last presentation showed, technical innovation, working with people, uh, we also saw earlier the, uh, the use of GIS uh, from Eugene and, and, and how that can help uh, using, uh, um, using uh, clones and so on to, to, uh, to actually uh, help uh, drones, sorry, not clones, uh, to actually survey land very, very quickly and accurately. Uh, there are obviously a number of other constraints uh, I think one of the points that I draw from the presentation so far is that many of them have been small scale. Uh, Kitima pointed out that uh, a lot of them maybe are small scale. We're picking up the low hanging fruit. Some of them are difficult to implement on private land. Uh, we've got a, a colonial hangover, which I'm sure Rob is going to refer to. Uh, and the whole issue ultimately is political as I know we will be addressing in the next webinar. So please do get ready to log in for the next webinar, starting at the same time next week, uh, where we're gonna have a range of presentations by a number of people from all over the world, including Martin Smolka, who will be talking about examples from Latin America, a region which we've not had uh, discussed today. And I have to say, when it comes to innovation in land tenure and land management generally, uh, Latin America has possibly been ahead of the curve uh, in introducing uh, politically uh, challenging and uh, practical, pragmatic approaches, which have uh, made a massive progress uh, in, uh, in, in a number of cities. If we look at the changes taking place politically in Colombia and in uh, Chile, uh, I think these, are, and now, of course, most recently in Brazil, uh, these are the uh, bases on which we can uh, hope to look forward to with uh, a degree of optimism. Now, I don't know if you've managed uh, to get that across, Rob, have you yet? So no worries. Hi, Rob. Um, I'm still waiting for your email. I have just emailed you um, regarding uh, which you could... I've emailed you in the last five minutes. Uh, I, I think you have sent me only um, a short document rather than the presentation. Really? Not a PowerPoint? No. Well, I'm happy to step back now because we're already two hours in. For Why don't to... you just speak uh, off the cuff, Rob? Uh, okay. Sure points that you've uh, been making would, but, be, would come over just as well. Jeff, yeah. Jeff, may I suggest something? Is it possible to invite and get Rob to come to the next meeting as well, because instead of missing it out, and I know- Yes, I've already got him on the next meeting for some other points. <laughs> but yeah, that's, fine. Know, that's fine. I mean, in that case, I'll just say a very few words. Uh, the last two speakers, um, Chantelou and Vijay, excellent presentation. I'm familiar with Kibera. And I think that that is one of the ways forward, because if you've got printed uh, maps, of what is actually there, you're halfway towards the politics of persuading the government to recognize you. Um, Africa is in some ways leading in this, partly because, of course, UN Habitat has its headquarters in Nairobi, and therefore some of the initiatives are taking place in Kenya and Zambia and other countries. So I think I would commend the work of UN Habitat um, 
and particularly the Global Land Tools Network, which uh, Jean Duplessis is in the room and has already um, mentioned that in chat. So there's a lot of information to be had there, and a lot of experimental stuff going on, which is very relevant to this webinar. Uh, and also, I think it's, I'm just going to have a couple of plugs for myself. The first is that uh, Jeff Payne has already mentioned it. Uh, I published an edited book. I edited a book for Springer Nature on land issues in urban governance in sub-Saharan Africa with over 20 contributors, one of whom was Eugene Chigbrook, who's already spoken today. So that is available and you can contact me for further information on that. And the other thing is literally yesterday's uh, news, the journal Land, which is an open access journal published by MDPI. And they are having a special issue on land laws and urban planning and urban development. And I have been invited to be the guest editor for this, or one of the guest editors. So if you watch, if you go to the Land Journal website, MDPI, uh, you'll see information about that because I'm sure many of the people in the audience would welcome the opportunity to get their research out globally. There's no question at all that open access journals of global spread are becoming very important in impact of research. And I think at that point I will step down now, but I'll be there for your next webinar and hopefully with a something suitable for the PowerPoint. So I'm um, step down now. Okay, Rob. Well, many thanks uh, for, for uh, coping with the uh, technical challenges, which uh, we all have to face it sooner or later. So well done for that and for your contribution. Now, we've just gone over a little over two hours um, and uh, we've covered all the presentations. We've had some points raised in the chat uh, which I think have been answered uh, reasonably well. But if anyone's got any final observations or comments they'd like to make, uh, please do uh, put those up now. Um, and while we'll, we'll do one final round on that uh, before I close the session. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, as, as I was saying earlier, while, while Rob was trying to share his screen, uh, the pros in terms of the examples we've seen today, the, the, the benefits or the key ingredients for success, I think, are the need to engage communities where people are involved actively in the development of their own areas, their own neighborhoods and housing settlements. There is a far greater chance for success than if it's a top down uh, government uh, or private sector led initiative that does not take the ultimate residents into account. I th another takeaway I draw from it is the benefits of an incremental approach, as I said. I think starting off uh, merely preventing evictions, as we saw in uh, a couple of the cases uh, today, uh, gives people the short to medium term security, which is absolutely vital if they're going to make any investment, replacing the roof, improving the toilet facilities or whatever. Um, and I think the, the, the fact that they can go out in the morning knowing their house will still be there in the evening is the basic starting point. Um, and and if, you, if you do it gradually, that makes the integration into the formal market take place over a longer period of time and dramatically reduces the risk of... Uh, uh, people buying up and incorporating uh, the uh, informal settlements uh, where the low-income groups are, are living on what would formerly be very expensive land, doing it on an incremental basis over, say, 10, 20, 30 years, slows down and reduces that risk and enables the poor to stay uh, in what would otherwise be unaffordable areas. And thirdly, I think the advantage of technical a use of drones for surveying and other high-tech systems for measuring boundaries, recording what people have, 
uh, and uh, using that widely can be a very, very quick, efficient and cost-effective means of improving tenure security. Um, the, uh, the, the limitations I think have become apparent today for me are as uh, Kimita, uh, Kitima and Barry Pinsky very well pointed out, is that where many of the examples are small scale. Um, and it's very, very difficult to see how we as professionals or activist citizens can create or facilitate the conditions which enable innovative approaches to go to scale. Uh, we are ultimately dealing not just with technical aspects, but with politics. And that is always messy, always challenging, but we do need to recognize that when we're taking up the challenge and uh, passing on the baton to try and improve access to uh, secure land and affordable land for those in great need. Uh, so with those final comments, if there's nothing else coming up in the check, Hi, Jeff. Uh, a couple of, I don't see uh, anything, but if you do, then I'd be happy to uh, address those to, this, to the various speakers. Hi, Jeff. There are a couple of questions uh, which are there in the chat. Oh, right. Excellent. Okay. So pick up on those, uh, Rudvala. Sure. They're in the Q&A box. The first question is uh, from Dr. Pradeep Rajshekharan. It, he has posed a question to all the speakers and asked them to respond to his queries. It's in three parts. The first, what is everyone's opinion of what shall be the prime focus? Tenure of land or the tenure of built space? Secondly, at which level? Tenure for individual, tenure for household, or tenure for community? He has also posed that maybe also have an idea of per capita residential built area or per household residential area requirement varying in the different contexts across the globe. Well, thank you very much indeed for that. I think you've uh, given us the basis for another webinar, uh, Pradeep. So thank you very much. Now, I don't know if uh, we'll be able to address all of these points with all of the speakers, but who would like to pick up uh, and address those as well as they can? Any of the uh, speakers care to uh, see if they can address that point? It's in. Hi, Jeff, can I jump in? Please do. Hi, hi. So I'll just have one point hi, to Jim. add. I think that's a, that's a great question, uh, Pradeep. So I think one thing I would add is like a lot of it depends also on the on the context and the density of the city. For example, I'll just quote one example from my ground experience in Mumbai versus Jaipur. So owning a piece of land or finding a security, tenure security on land in a context like Mumbai is extremely difficult as compared to, let's say, having a tenure a security for a piece of apartment or a house in a building. As compared to in the case of Jaipur, where the city is more radial and the land availability is much more, the demand of people usually is to get a patta or a form of a title on the land and then eventually they build security on the house they build on that land. So I think I'll just offer two cents on that, but of course it's for a longer discussion. Sorry for the disturbance. Thank you very much. That's very, very helpful, Rohit. Um, anyone else care to uh, respond to Pradeep's question? No? Well, while you're thinking about that, there is another question from Fizo. Uh, Chadakwa, for which many thanks. Um, he's asking, does anyone have experience in occupancy licensing in Zambia? And if so, would you say it's been a successful endeavor? Rob, you're pretty, uh, well, very knowledgeable about uh, Africa. Do you have any thoughts on that at all? I think Rob has dropped out. Oh, he has dropped out, has he? Anyone else got any thoughts on that? I don't know, would you know anything on that, Mark? No, um, I don't know if Jean Duplessis is still here. Um, John, uh, yes, maybe Jean does. I haven't worked in Zambia. No. He may have a choice still here. Yeah, I think he may have done. 
Well, look, on that basis, I think uh, we've covered a lot of today already. We've gone beyond the time limit. So I would like to personally thank all the presenters for excellent contributions to the webinar. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, and uh, I'd like to now invite uh, Kirti or uh, Ujvala to close the webinar for today. And Ujvala, Ujvala, please. Come back next week at the same time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think the discussion was extremely insightful because we had a varied uh, number of examples from across contexts that we are actually not very familiar with. For me, especially, it was very eye opening as someone who's a very, very new professional in the field of urban research. So it was very exciting and interesting to see examples from across. Um, very grateful to everyone to have joined here and um, taken out this much time and put in the effort of presenting to all of us. Um, I would urge everyone to register for the next webinar, which is going to be held on the 25th of January, which is the second episode in this series of um, Access to Land. And we have a, um, a few recurring names as well. Uh, we have Banishri and Rob who, who will be presenting. And we also have a list of other people who are going to be there. So it's going to be another um, really great session, hopefully. Um, with lesser technical glitches. Um, thank you, everyone. And I think it has been really great. I've compiled all the links together, which have been added into the chat. And this webinar will be available um, both on YouTube as well as on uh, InHalf's website. Thank you, Dula. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Mark, thank you. Vijay, thank you. Thank you. Jeff, uh, Satanshu. Rohit Bhai, Banashi, Ben, everyone, thank you very much. We're very <laughs> delighted. And we look forward to seeing uh, some of you at least on the 25th. That's not very far. Uh, Joff, thank you very much. It was wonderful. Very nice. Very, very, very right. good. And uh, to learn so much uh, on this very difficult subject. Uh, uh, we just have, uh, we do kind of talk a little more some point of time in terms of how to do this in some places here. In Ahmedabad and India, I too, huh? Where, where are you? You based in 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 Nairobi? Sorry, no, no, no. I, I actually I come from India right now. I'm living in Germany. I did my internship in Nairobi, Kenya. Okay. okay. With you and Habitat. Okay. Yeah. okay. Both we'll of us are based in Germany. Uh, we'll talk at you. Uh, we'll talk at you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Looking Thank forward you, to interacting with you in the future. And Mark, do you know my good friend uh, uh, Geeta and Alistair Randall? Yes, I have used them in the past, yes. <laughs> yeah. so they, were, they worked with me many years ago in India yes. for about, about five years and then set up this uh, development group. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you so much.